Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to Politics and Prose. Uh, my name is Lisa Martinez. I'm the events manager here at the bookstore, um, where we now host in-person events along with trips and classes, among other things. So uh, head to politics-prose.com for a full list of everything that we have confirmed. We have some really exciting events coming up for the rest of the year. Um, just a quick reminder that we will be doing a Q&A. So there's a uh, mic over there um, by that by that column. Um, so just make sure you step up to the mic so that everybody can hear your question. We are live streaming today. Um, so we want to make sure that all our virtual audience can hear and that we catch it in the recording. Um, and then another reminder, there is another event after this. Um, so just leave your chairs where they are once the event has concluded. Um, we'll be hosting a signing over here at this big table. Um, so make sure to get your copies of the book so that you can get them personalized. Um, and the last thing, I will just ask that everybody silence their cell phones to make sure there's no disruptions during the event. Um, and now, it is my honor to welcome Noor Jahan Bose uh, to Politics and Prose for her memoir, Daughter of the Agun Mukha. Uh, Noor Jahan Bose is a feminist writer, social worker, and activist living between the US and Bangladesh. She was born in 1938 in Katakali village on an island in what is now so southern Bangladesh during the British colonial era in India. She was a teen political activist for the Bangla language movement and um, the later part of the Bangladesh independence movement. She was a refugee during the Liberation War, which resulted in an independent Bangladesh in 1971. She moved to the US in 1974, but continues to go back regularly to Bangladesh. She's the founder of two US-based organizations to empower South Asian women, ASHA, which is now um, Ashiana, and Samhati. She has a BA in Bangla literature from Dhaka University and a master's in social work from Catholic University here in DC. Um, she worked for many years as a social worker with refugees and the elderly at Catholic Charities, which foster children for Prince George's County, Maryland, and with ICU patients at DC General Hospital. She also founded the first Bangla school in the DC area, running it out of her home for more than 10 years. Her, school, um, her first book, the autobiography Agun Mukhar Maya, was published in 2009 in Bangladesh after coming out in serial form in the Jankata newspaper. The book became a bestseller and in 2009 was named one of the top 10 books in Bangladesh. In 2010, Nur Jahan received the Ananya Prize for the book given to one woman writer every year in Bangladesh. In 2011, Ananda Publishers bought out a new edition of the book in India. The book has been the subject of numerous reviews and panel discussions in Bangladesh and India. In 2016, the book won Bangladesh's highest honor, the Bangla Academy Literary Award in the autobiography category. Noor Jahan has also published several travelogues and other books. Daughter of the Agun Mukha was translated by Rebecca Whittington and edited by Monica Jahan Bose um, and published in May 2023 by Hearst Publishers in the UK. It has now arrived in the US with a release date of October 15th, 2023, with a distribution by Oxford University Press. We're thrilled to be able to showcase it here and host the official book launch. Now I'll introduce her daughter, Monica. Monica Jahan Bose is a Bangladeshi American artist, lawyer, and climate activist whose work spans painting, printmaking, film, performance, public art, and writing. Her ongoing art and advoca advocacy project, Storytelling with Saris, is a collaboration with women farmers from her mother's ancestral village. She is a board member of Samhati and currently manages the Katakali Eco Empowerment Project. She was the editor of Daughter of the Agun Mukha, and her photo of the river appears on the cover. Um, so now, please join me in welcoming Monica to the stage. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to Elisa for that wonderful introduction. We are super honored um, that Politics and Prose is hosting the official book launch as an official event. Please support them and buy all your books here and not on Amazon. Um, they not only employ Elisa, who happens to be my, class, my daughter's classmate from high school, but also Bernard, who's in the back, his daughter, Kira. So we have to keep these places alive. Um, and uh, uh, Politics and Prose is one of the few bookstores left in DC. So thank you so much. Uh, my mother and I want to thank you all for being here. We're really thrilled to see so many friends and family and neighbors. 
and some of you are watching on YouTube. Thanks to you as well. Um, so I was actually looking at my email to try to figure out how long my mother and I have been working on this translation. Um, we started in 20, the book came out in 20, 2009 in Bangla. We started in 2011 trying to find a translator and many of you have helped over the years. You know who you are, thank you. We had various chapters floating back and forth but we really didn't want to give the job to anyone until we knew we could publish it and, to, and then that didn't happen until we met Rebecca Whittington. Um, she is an amazing translator. We met her through my daughter, Thuli, who was a student at University of California, Berkeley. She was taking, my daughters both know Bangla, but my daughter, uh, my older daughter decided to take a class at university, at college, and her teacher, her professor, um, um, Abhijit Paul, um, um, is from West Bengal, I think, originally, but I asked her, I said, why don't you ask your professor if he knows any translators? And she did, and turns out his wife is a master translator. Rebecca Whittington has a PhD from the University of California in um, Berkeley in South Asian studies as well as translation, and she translates four languages, Bangla, Tamil, Urdu, and Hindi. And I Googled her, read one of her things, and I was like, and so I reached out to her, and we finally connected, and, January 2020, right before the pandemic. Um, and so this was our pandemic project, was working on the, um, on the memoir. And she was an amazing person to work with. It was a true collaboration with my mother and her and me, and even um, Rebecca's daughter, Kuheli, would go on the Zoom calls and recite poetry in Bangla and like, talk to my mother. So it's been an amazing experience. So super thanks. Without Rebecca Whittington, we would not be here today. And um, we finally, we also want to thank um, Rebecca Whittington's um, book agent, Kanishka Gupta in Delhi. He worked tirelessly. It was not easy. The manuscript was basically done, but it was the pandemic, right? And so it was very difficult to pitch to publishers. Um, it was a very difficult time. People were dying around the world. But he kept with it. And um, we decided to, um, to work with Hearst Publishers in the UK. Um, they're right in London, I think in Somerset House. Um, and they, um, they uh, we wanted to go with them because we wanted to really publish in an English-speaking country so it'd have more readership and also so we could get the books here to our friends. And they work with Oxford University Press to put them on ships and actually bring the books here. So we are very grateful also to Kanishka Gupta and also to um, Michael Dwyer at, um, at Hearst Publishers and his entire team, incredible team that we worked with to actually get this book out as quickly as possible. Team of designers, PR people, marketing people, um, you name it, editors, um, lots of amazing people to work with. And uh, finally, I want to thank my mother, without whose perseverance this wouldn't have happened. She's been try saying from the very beginning, my, I want to see this book happen. While I'm alive, I want my friends to read it. I want the next generation to read it. So if it hadn't been for my mom, <laughs> like pushing, 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 I think I would have given up too, but I didn't give up. So um, I'm very happy. And many of you here have, you know, have helped with the process and helped try to introduce us to different people. I will say that I, in my opinion, there are not that many excellent translators of Bangla English in the world. We did a global search and it's really not easy. It's a hard, it's, translation is not easy and Bangla doesn't always translate well. Um, but I think we tried to retain her voice in this, in this manuscript. So, um, and then I will show you the new book some of you have already gotten it. Here it is for the audience on YouTube. Daughter of the Agunimukha. And I also want to show you the original books. I had my mother pull these out because they are also important to the story. This is the original edition in Bangladesh. Agun Mukharme um, from 2009. There have been four editions in Bangla of this book. This book is hugely popular still. Um, this is the uh, edition that was put out in India with a whole different cover. And uh, each version is actually different. This has new chapters that were expanded on the, um, the refugee experience to appeal to uh, readers in India uh, and, and features people that lived in West Bengal at the time. And this is the latest Bangla edition um, that came out with UPL um, last year. Um, and this was actually also influenced, it's a new edition that um, is, is more similar to the English edition because at the time we were reworking the whole book for the English version to make it accessible to English readers. So some of that is reflected in here. So for those of you who've read the Bangla book, I would still suggest getting the English book. There's a lot of stuff in there that's completely new. There really is. A lot of things are not in there. For example, Michael and my wedding, thank God, is not in the English, <laughs> it's not in the English version. <laughs> the whole chapter has been taken out. 
<laughs> but, <laughs> but there's lots of new things. So um, I will um, read a few passages to get us started. And I have, um, and I'll, then I'll introduce my two amazing, also uh, Firemouth women um, friends, Sunu Chandi and Kritika Ghosh. Thank you for being here. Let me just read a little bit from the preface. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to read you a couple of the reviews. So um, the, the folks at Hearst also reached out to um, a number of amazing people to review the book and give us blurbs. And I'll just read out a couple of those to give you a taste. A riveting and moving read, Nur Jahan's compelling life journey is a story of courage and resilience and is a true inspiration to feminist activists around the world. That's just Jaispreet Kaur, um, poet, educator, and author of Brown Girl Like Me. Another one, Bose's memoir unlocks a hidden nation before its identity was originally and was regionally and religiously determined. It's an incantation of love and violence Family Secrets and Resilience by a Deltaic daughter of the con on the confluence of the rivers of fire. That's Lipika Pelham, journalist and author of Passing an Alternative History of Identity. And I will read from the preface, just a few lines. I have to slow down. <laughs> As a child, I remember hearing everyone tell stories about the river Agun Mukha, the mouth of fire. When I heard the name Agun Mukha, a shiver of fear would run through me. The Agun Mukha's frightening aspects were legendary. The people of Golachipa, Kebupara, Amtoli, Chor Kajol, and other villages and towns on the islands and on the banks of the Agun Mukha had to cross the river for work or business. No one kept count of how many people lost their lives on the crossing. Since the Agun Mukha is an estuary or confluence of seven rivers, a billowing mass of water flows into it from every direction as far as the eye can see. The reflection of the sun's rays on the powerful waves reminded me of the flames of a blazing fire. The Agun Mukha's impact on my life is endless. All the people of this region are my kin, close to my heart. Their stories are part of my own story. So that's from the original Bangla translated. Um, and so Agun means fire, and Mukha means mouth. So literally, my mother has become known. I mean, she was always well known in Bangladesh for all the work she's done for <laughs> activism. But the book has, now she's actually called Agun Mukha, like daughter of the Agun Mukha, or just Agun Mukha, like fire mouth. That's what we call her. <laughs> so, <laughs> and people come running up to her and say, Agun Mukha. <laughs> So it's kind of um, it's interesting. So I'm very excited to have two other Firemouth women here to um, join the uh, to to give their reflections on the book, and um, I'm going to introduce them. I'm so delighted. They're super busy. Both of them have had so many events and so much going on with work, but they are they took the time. They got the advanced copy of the book from London and spent time reading it. And I'm just so grateful to both of you. So. Sunupi Chandi. Sunupi Chandi is a civil rights lawyer and poet. She is a senior advisor with Democracy Forward, supporting work towards a more inclusive democracy, something we need more than ever. She was the legal director of the National Women's Law Center for six years, working to ensure gender equality, something we need more than ever. Sunu is also the author of an award-winning collection of poems, My Dear Comrades, published by Regal House in 2023. And we had the incredible book event here uh, earlier this year, and the book is also available here. Sunu is a board member of the Transgender Law Center and was honored to be included as one of the 2021 Queer Women of Washington. She has a law degree from Northwestern University School of Law and an MFA in Creative Writing from Queen College. Thank you so much for being here, Sunu. Um, also, I'm going to introduce my uh, dear friend, another brilliant person, Kritika Ghosh. She is the executive director of the Asian Pacific Islander Domestic Violence Research Project, also known as DVRP. She has over 20 years of experience working in the gender-based violence field. She has developed innovative programming on prevention of gender-based violence in immigrant and refugee communities 
through transformative education and outreach campaigns, such as the development of graphic novels and photo novels highlighting sexual violence and the development of trauma art therapy workshops. I've attended some of these, they're amazing. She has a BA in sociology and women's studies from Simmons University in Boston and a master's in gender studies from the London School of Economics and Political Science. So I'm gonna turn it over to my wonderful friends and my mother and I'm actually gonna join and sit here. So we're gonna have, a, uh, uh, have them give remarks and. Uh, Suna is going to give the whole um, uh, layout of what we're doing, but feel free to, when, you, when it's time for questions, and my mother also to speak in Bangla. This is a translation. We want this to be inclusive, and I'm happy to translate if there's anything in Bangla. Okay? Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? All right. Let's give a hand to Monica for pulling this together, and to all of you and the family for showing up. And we are here for a celebration, right? Auntie? Yeah. We're here to celebrate the English translation of this very powerful book that you've already heard has gone through multiple um, countries and languages and gone through such a process when it came to translating this book. So uh, we're going to just start with an opening question and I'll call her Noor Jahan Bose, but in our culture, somebody who's your friend's mom, you will call auntie. So sometimes I might also call her auntie so you know what's going on. <laughs> so just first I'm gonna ask auntie a question, then Krithika and I are gonna read short passages and talk about the book a little bit. Then we'll have some discussion and then you'll have a chance to ask questions, okay? So first, let's look at this book. Hold this up, okay. The first question for you is, how did you feel when you saw there's an English translation of your powerful story? Well, <laughs> I waited 14, 15 years almost after, since I published my Bengali books, and it was very, um, I want to hold it. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but uh, uh, as soon as I saw that the, the uh, the readers were really responsive, and the people are calling from everywhere, from all over the world. All of them are Bengalis. And some young people uh, wrote a letter to me, said, Auntie, you, your book changed our life. I mean, that's, that, that is the word I heard from almost everybody uh, called me. But I never heard, I, I thought that maybe there will be some, uh, uh, you know, criticism of my, because I wrote something so openly mm. that nobody ca nobody does, uh, not even the, the radicals or, uh, you know, revolutionary women I have never. So, uh, but I, I never had that. So I thought it's about time that it, um, my other friends from all over the world, I have friends, and especially the gen new generation, they have to read my book since so everybody is praising the book that very different, very open. And uh, so I was trying to find some uh, translator tried, but I didn't have to. So I was almost giving up that maybe I would not be get any until I die. But when I found Rebecca, she was excellent. She asked me so many questions and found so many things I forgot because this was my only past book and I never wrote anything except the letter. So 70 years old when I started writing a column, I, I didn't even know how to start. I called one of the prominent uh, uh, journalists. I didn't know, I knew, knew him name, but I didn't know. I thought uh, I'm not John Bors, maybe you don't know me. She said, who told you that I don't know you? I know very well. You are, oh. Do you have anything to uh, publish? I said, no. I'm just thinking to write something, but I don't know what to write. Is it anything you want? Oh. Just yeah. r write on and send it to me. Oh. I will publish, publish it every week. Once a week is the literary uh, day. So, so I thought, what should I start? So I start thinking about Ma, my mom, who taught me to be a revolutionary, oh. to be a radical, who at three years old, I was telling to members, she told me, Nurjahan, look at your, the women, how the women were treated in your family, oh. large, large family. We have maids, young maid servants, and then, then also 
uh, poor, 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 poor people, poor relations, younger daughters, they were all coming into our household and helping us. And then, you know, so I was not careful really at that time, but she told me that this, these women are all abused, you know, oh, wow. because they are poor and they, are, they, 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 have, they don't have any power. So I just want you to look at that, and I want you to get education. Wherever you have to go, I will send you. And this is a life of a hell. I don't want you to live as a woman, a literate woman, and get married at 10, 10 o'clock, 10, 10 years old. Yeah. So, and that, I, from then, I started looking everywhere I went, when, everywhere. And my, she sent me to school, other, I, other villages, when I was nine years old. Uh, that was 85 years ago, you know, no, no, 80 years ago, something like that. So it was like a jungle, but she knew. She said, Nur Jahan, I know there will be difficulties, there will be danger, but I cannot uh, uh, save you all your life. You have to do that. You have to do that. So that's, that, that I got that. So wherever I went, everywhere I went, with, even with my husband, I talked to the women everywhere I went. I talked to the women, I looked at them, and then I found out this uh, problem. So when I found out that English book has been published and a first copy came to me, and I just thought, hold this book. And I thought, my God, it's, li it's like, a, like a, my new baby. I have a new baby. <laughs> I have three babies before. I have, yeah. It was a difficult birth, difficult, I mean, my pregnancy was very, very difficult. I couldn't <laughs> even drink even water. But as soon as I have the babies, Pace, and I hold it in the, on my heart, and I all my pain has been all vanished. It's Aww. like a, it's like a heaven, you know. Aww. Really, I, I don't know how any any mother feels, but I felt three three children I have. I felt I'm so proud. I'm so happy. I can take any pain, anything anywhere from the world. But they, these are my uh, my my own creation, and then. It had been a long time. Monita was the last child when I was 30, and now I'm 85. <laughs> but the, the books just, I hold it in my heart, and I was so happy. I thought I got everything all over again, so I'm so happy. And I'm, I'm really happy to t tell you that this is something I, I'm going to cherish, you know, as long as I live. So I'm, I'm glad you all came here and, and encouraged me also. So I'm really thank you very much from heart, my heart. Yay. So, and, and I, I, I can tell you, I can tell you, whoever read this book, not going to feel bad. Whoever is reading the book will say, to, yeah, it is a good book, okay? <laughs> it, because it, it is a courageous book. I mean, the last chapter I wrote here was difficult, very difficult, yeah. But Monica's daughter, my, my granddaughter, when even she was 13 years old, she said, Nanu, if you cannot write it, nobody can write it. Mm. If we, we know what you have been through, but when you die, nobody is going to believe us. You have to write it. Mm. And she was the real force to me. Mm. Uh, they write it, and I did. And then my children also. My children also <laughs> told me. I mean, they, they, they said to me, but when a 13-year-old 13 13 year uh, granddaughter t tell you that you have to write it, I, I, there was no other way, you know. It, it's painful. When you read it, some people will cry. I know that. Mm -hmm. It is painful. All my life it was painful, but still I did it. So I want everybody, every woman or every man to treat women uh, with respect, hmm. and and uh, that is it. That's the only thing I'm going to tell everybody. The, the, the baby girl, the day the baby girl born, the everybody have the has to cuddle her, kiss her, and raise her like a like a flower. Like and also make her strong and educated. That's the way we are going to have a really good society, good good place to live. Uh, you know, so that is my 
yeah, request to everybody and uh, have a good <laughs> go, go to reading. Okay, all right. I don't know if I'll get my copy back though, will I? <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Let's give her a hand for that wonderful introduction to why the, how the book came about, why it came about. I think you answered some of our questions. Yeah. And now we will go to Krithika, because I know you wanted us to read a little bit from it yeah. and talk about it, right? OK, I'm going to turn it to Krithika. Yeah. And we'll, yeah, we're going to have questions from you all at the end. There's also a few seats up here if people want to come up. Feel free. In the, in the front row, there's two seats. Um, and now we're each going to read a little passage and talk about it, and then we'll have some more discussion. Can you hear me? OK. We'll just give folks, uh, yeah, there's two seats up here in the first row if anybody's looking for something. OK. It's lovely to see you all here today for the launch of Noor Jahan Bose's <coughs> Daughter of the Agun Mukha. I'm honored to have been asked to be a part of this launch uh, of Noor Jahan Auntie's memoirs, which tell the story of her journey, of her childhood in her ancestral vi village of Katakali, to spanning the globe from Borishal to Dhaka, Cambridge, and eventually Washington, DC. This memoir touches upon a broad range of themes from the idyllic life in Katakali to the literal and metaphorical storms that Miss Bose encountered in her life. I was particularly touched by how Miss Bose's mother was a driving force in her life to get an education and stand on her feet financially. This was not common amongst women of her generation, and it is clear that Miss Bose's critical thinking skills come from both her academic pursuits and from her experiences as someone who was part of political and social organizing, and her mother was a huge part of that. Miss Bose's mother, Johora Begum's influence permeates through the book and throughout her life, and I will read a passage from the book indicating that. As I grew older, Ma pointed out to me the intolerable and unjust condition of women in our community and the world. For example, my cousin Rupjan was in school with me until class four. She was forcibly married to a man who was at least 50 years old and had grown up children. Rupjan was absolutely against the marriage, but she had no choice. Ma said, look what happens to girls in this village. I want you to get educated and move out of this hell. She made me aware of the behavior of the men in our household towards the women and girls who worked for us and our dependent fe female relatives. Many of our male relatives tried to exploit these women sexually. My mother tried to marry off our dependent female relatives quickly to get them out of harm's way. She had to suffer a lot of humiliation from the men of the family because of this, but she put up with it in silence. Ma vowed to educate all of us girls and worked hard to prevent our early marriage. From a very young age, Ma sat us down besides her and taught us to read and write. Even though she was married young, Ma had been educated at the local school as well as at home and kept on studying until she was 12 or 13. In Munchi Bari, we could study at the nearby government-run Kathakali prim Primary School only up to class four. When I was nine years old and ready for class five, Ma sent me to my Fuppu's house in Felabunia to continue my education. That was around March 1947. We later see how even in the midst of political unrest, Ms. Bose continues her college education in Dhaka and eventually receives a master's in social work degree from Catholic University. Um, and this was much later in life and it really speaks to her perseverance and desire to, to ensure that you know, she's contributing to society. As a South Asian woman who was a survivor and has been working on issues of gender-based violence for over 20 years, I was deeply moved to read about the passages that discuss sexual violence both on a personal and community level. By talking about her experiences, Ms. Bose has normalized discussion on consent and child sexual abuse and broken the stigma that exists in our very patriarchal communities by bringing these issues to the forefront. Ms. Bose not only talks about these issues, but also founded organizations that support survivors of gender-based violence and provide young women with avenues for growth and empowerment. These include Ashiana locally and Shammuti in Katakali, Bangladesh. I want to give uh, thanks, heartfelt thanks to Ms. Bose for creating a path and safe space for all those in the movement, including myself and those that come after me to share our experiences while fighting for social change. A key part of Ms. Bose's memoirs touch upon her experience 
as someone in an interreligious marriage while living in Kar uh, Karachi and uh, while crossing the border into India in 1971 to escape from the East Pakistan Army. These chapters provide a critical lens into how the entire Jahan Bose family had to adapt new identities for survival, and also how they maintained their identities in defiance of graced odds. I'm going to read a passage from page 202 of the book. Oh, okay, If you have the book, you can uh, follow. We were in Karachi for three and a half years. I could have learned Urdu if I wanted, but I didn't. Whenever I met West Pakistani neighbors or friends from Swadesh's office, they would start talking to me in Urdu. They never even asked if I knew Urdu or not. They assumed I must know Urdu. This made me feel very angry and offended. They refused to learn Bangla, but they insisted we had to learn Urdu. They thought of themselves as superior to us. A lot of people criticized me for not wearing salwar kameezes and for wearing a teep or a bindi. They told me repeatedly that saris and teeps are for Hindus. After my youngest daughter was born, the landlady came to see her. When she heard her name and that her name was Onita, she looked unhappy and said, that's not a Muslimani name, it's a Hindu name. I didn't like their bossing me around, even about my own daughter's name. Mm -hmm. Onita means unrelenting or unbowed in Bangla. After Onita was born, we also gave Mini a longer name, Monica, which means small gem in Bangla. Through these passages, Ms. Bose gives us a hint of what it was to be culturally Bengali, living in Karachi in the 60s, in a time where Bengalis were expected to assimilate into Pakistani culture through speaking Urdu, changing their clothing, and more. It is also a testament to how Ms. Bose found ways to challenge these, uh, challenge these prescriptions by maintaining her culture her lang and language under difficult odds. In another passage, she talks about the difficult decision she had to make with the survival of her family while escaping from the Pakistani army in Bangladesh to India. After 25th March 1971, I'd given Swadesh a Muslim name. My children learned to call him by that name. Still, I thought if someone threatened them, they might accidentally say their father's real name, Swadesh. So I told them, just keep quiet and not answer anyone who might speak to them. Finally, we had to see, we see how Ms. Bose had to hide her Muslim identity upon reaching West Bengal. As refugees in India, Shodesh could now use his real name, but now it was my turn to hide my name and my religion. At the suggestion of a friend, I started using the name Joya instead of Noor Jahan. Noor Jahan is a Persian name, mean, meaning the light of the universe, and it would immediately reveal that I was from a Muslim family. Muslims are a minority in India, and Hindu-Muslim marriages were and are not looked upon favorably. As we are all aware, religious and communal conflicts continue in our world from within South Asia and beyond. What Ms. Bose's words show us are the human impacts of having to hide one's identity due to Islamophobia and xenophobia. Her work in supporting refugees transcending religious, class, caste identities provides a contrast to the violence that existed around her. Daughter of the Agun Mukha is a complex read and one that includes two love stories, a detailed look into the political organizing in Bangladesh and fight for Bangladesh's independence, a story of Ms. Bose developing her own path while combined, combating patriarchy and creating a better world for those who come after her. My mother and uh, Mashis, who are originally from West Bengal, had read the original Bangla version of Ms. Uh, Bose's memoirs and had indicated to me how deeply it had impacted them. It was also clear that Ms. Bose's writing transcended boundaries and nationalities, and hopefully the English translation is going to reach a whole new generation of readers. Once again, please join me in congratulating Ms. Bose on the publication of her memoirs in English and giving us access to her rich life and experiences. Thank you, and as was discussed, Kritika is a leader in the gender justice and, and, and support for survivors, particularly for South Asian and um, other communities here in DC and beyond, right? So please give a hand to Kritika for those beautiful remarks and for your activism and leadership. Yeah, so I met Monica um, and Kritika really, well Kritika I met many years ago. Monica I met through a mutual friend Shamtoli Haq uh, about eight, seven, eight years ago. 
And so I was so excited to hear that your mom is also a writer and we both have our books coming out. And everything you said about the, being a baby, I understand. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting and tough experience, but everything you said I agree with that it's worth it at the end. So I'm gonna read um, just a couple of short pieces from the book that really spoke to me. And, uh, and then I will explain why that was, why those are the pieces that I selected. Okay, so one part is when uh, you were in Cambridge, and I'll read it and then I'll talk about it. So we were in Cambridge for three and a half years. Ours was flat number three. Even though I felt terribly lonely there at first, I slowly shook off my depression. When I made friends with the other wives in the laundry room, I saw they were suffering from loneliness and depression just like me. When Minnie was a few months old, I got up the nerve to invite them over for coffee. I told them to bring their friends too. That night, I made shingara and cake and felt excited and anxious all night. I wondered, would they really come to my house? And if they came, what would I say to them? The next morning at 10.30, they all showed up at my house one by one with their children in tow. My home was full of people. Everyone helped make tea and coffee, and the, sh how do you say, shingara? Yeah. Shingara and cake disappeared in no time. Before we knew it, it was one o'clock. The party ended with an invitation to have coffee at another woman's house the next day. We spent the next few days laughing, talking, and having a good time together, and the kids had a great time playing together too. After that, we decided that every day, two mothers would take care of all the children while the other mothers could take a break and do shopping, read a book, watch a movie, take a nap. This was the beginning of our play group, which created a nice, structured network of friends. Our husbands also got to know each other and became friends. We learned a lot about other languages and cultures at our little tea parties and dinner parties. We began inviting each other over on holidays, like Christmas and Eid, coming together in good times and bad, playing cards on Saturday, watching certain TV programs together, and so on. We slowly became one big family. Our loneliness and depression were replaced by a feeling of well-being and community. Our children had a fantastic time. Later, this experience at Cambridge served me well in new destinations. Even if it was difficult at first, my efforts to connect with others and create a community have always been successful in the end. I've never lacked good friends. Well, that's obvious. Look at this audience. <laughs> I think that if I hadn't spent decades abroad, I wouldn't have mastered this skill. So I picked that as one of my, uh, the pieces that I really loved in the book because it reminded me of our immigrant families and my parents' experiences when they came from Kerala, South India, and found their community slowly, slowly, and living in many places where they may be the only people from Kerala, maybe sometimes the only Indians, only South Asians, but finding that community. And it reminded me of my immigrant experience and also the need to build community wherever you are with the people who you share experiences with. And I think that's what you did with this book. As Kritika said, when people find their experiences reflected, they feel less alone and they feel more empowered. So thank you for that. Um, and also, um, as I was saying, I'm not gonna read any poems, but this is my book, My Dear Comrades, which has a lot of the same themes in terms of gender-based violence and community building. And so I was really happy to do this program together. Now, the second part. So as um, Andy said and as Kritika said, there's a lot of um, episodes in here personally community-based about gender-based violence and about the need to work to stop it and how we can do that together. And um, I have a poem called A Good Job for SK, 
where I was representing a young woman who say who suffered sexual violence at workplace and her father said just you know what go get your GED get a good job because in good jobs things like this don't happen to girls which we all know is not true <laughs> and so I didn't want to tell her that right I did I said it really depends on the place the workplace the people there some places are better than others but we all know that's not true so that part um, I think really was reflected in this piece. When I was growing up in the village, I thought it must be only in poor, educated, uh, poorly educated and uneducated rural societies that women are objectified and oppressed. When I went to study in the city, I saw that even in educated society, a woman's position was the same. Here too, she was oppressed. Then I thought maybe the condition of women is like this only in backward, backward societies like us and more developed societies. Surely women are given more respect. But when I went abroad, I saw that women were oppressed in almost every household in those countries too. I kept my eyes and ears open and began to understand the place of women in society worldwide. Many girls are victims of sexual abuse at very young ages in their own homes, mostly at the hands of close relatives, family, friends. And so this social disease was all around me. And so she says, from a young age, I always kept a keen eye on the girls and women around me. I understood their pain, their immobility, and helplessness. So she became friends with these people in Cambridge, realized they were as helpless as me, and then sorrows and their sorrows and mine flowed together. And this is the part I put a big star next to. Instead of suffering alone, I gained strength through my women friends. Thank you. So I think a lot of the questions you answered in the beginning because you shared so much um, about the book. Is there anything you want to add briefly about sort of why you wrote the book that you didn't mention before, or did you feel like you mentioned most of it? As you like. I think I, I dropped a little bit. Yeah, I did. <coughs> this is my, the, uh, my, I said my mother was the main force that she, she, the, she, she opened my eyes, my observation, because I never knew any, any mother will do that, but she was very, uh, she, I studied on the fifth grade in the school, but she was reading Rabindranath, Tagore, and, and all sorts of Bengali Upanash novels, and so she was very, in a way, she was a very educated woman, and her, her, her vision was far, very far, and so she told me that, that what is going on here, you saw, and I am, opening your eyes, and I want you, if you don't go out and that doesn't face the pain or uh, dishonor or whatever, then you can, uh, you will be married off for, uh, as soon as you are 10 years old, and I don't want that. I want to get out, get education, and do something with your life, and then come back. Don't forget the whole thing. So that was the main reason I, I gathered. And when I came here, I got um, experience more and more. I read so many books. Even when I was 18, I read Tolstoy's Anna, Anna Karenina, you know, Anna Karenina and War and Peace. 18 years old, a young girl uh, in Bangladesh for a Muslim family doesn't know English very well, but I read 10 times. And I cried on the floor oh. how much pain Anna Karenina felt, you know, and I felt her pain. Oh. He, she has to leave her son. She has to, she doesn't have, her husband doesn't love, love her, but she, she, even she left with her lover, he also disowned her and she has to kill herself. So I see in every, books I read uh, from all over the world, all classical books I was read, finished when I was f f uh, 25 years old. And nobody could believe that the, peop the two men who married me, they were amazed <laughs> whether I have, is, is, is uh, I mean, uh, Monica's father told me, asked me, 
uh, what what kind of gift I want to bring from for you from Karachi? I said Ibsen's place, and he br <laughs> and he brought it and he said, "Are you really reading it?" <laughs> I, I said, "What? Yeah, of course. I finished almost all." So uh, my uh, my I was physically confined in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a, like a prisoner. I cannot go anywhere. I, I even had to uh, uh, burqa, you know, the big covering, because I had to be with my uncle, uh, my aunt, to study. And they thought, I, if I uh, study and stay with them, I have to cover myself from head to foot. And my family said, no way. But I said, my mother and I said, if we don't do it, then I will become home, no education, and I will be get get uh, get off with a with a wife and uh, you know the, the life is my life just ended my, my mother so I said I will do that so I did that I worked four years and I know the pain and that indignity uh, disgrace wearing uh, covering yourself I'm not so all sorts of reason reason I you know. I write the, my, my book, and so my mother mother was the pioneer who uh, really, yeah. I sh I'm sure she's, a, wherever she is, she's very happy for, for, for her daughter. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, you know, uh, we um, recognize that there's only 10 minutes left, so we want to open it up for Q&A, even though we have lots of questions that we wanted to ask uh, Nurja and Auntie, but we um, would love to hear from you all if you have any questions. Yes. Thank you so much for being here today. I um, um, I really appreciate your words. This really was very meaningful. My question was, um, in reading your book, one 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 story in your book that I found very interesting was reading about your friendship. Was reading about your friendship in Bethesda with your friendship in Bethesda with Rose Wiener. She really struck me like a very yeah, interesting character and really a good person. I was interested, um, would you be able to speak some about Rose Wiener and what and what you took away from for, from those interactions and that friendship? Yeah. Uh, uh, Mike, no? Thank you so much. She's, she's, she's the, uh, I, you know, I'm a very social person. So when I come to a new place, I always wait seven days. And after that, I went to everybody's house and invited them. So I came to Bannockburn. The Bannockburn was a very, very, um, you know, enlightened neighborhood. And they have a community center. They have a swimming pool. They have uh, association. And then have their newspaper. You know, it's like uh, very, very uh, enlightened. And so I thought. It, this is the, uh, my husband and I decided to uh, rent it an apartment there, so we did. But seven days, my husband told me, don't let, don't get out. This is not Europe. This is not Britain. <laughs> Somebody will take you out and, and then rape you and then throw it in the, in the river. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, this is not 100 years back, you know. She said, no, don't get out. So, but after seven days, I saw only the cars are running around. Coming nobody stopped me, nobody called me, nobody came to see me. And he goes to office, children goes to school. So I went to school and I wanted to be doing something, some help, helping the student. And then I rose every day, I see in the back of my kitchen, uh, a elderly, she just retired, elderly lady, it is November, month of November, the, she's raking uh, lips. So I thought maybe she's the only one I see doing working, you know. So maybe I can I should walk and say hello. So after seven days, I, mean, I went. I went to walk, uh, and I said, "Good morning, uh, uh, Miss." She said, "Oh, you! I know. I'm sorry. I know the Indian family moved there. I never seen any Indian sari in front of me. And sorry, I read about all these Indian books, you know." You know, I'm sorry. Let's go inside. So uh, it, I thought maybe you don't, you, you don't, you don't uh, want to look, mix with other people. You want maybe you know, your personal life. 
So she took me inside the house, she gave me a mix in coffee, and started talking, and then she said, are you coming tonight to the uh, uh, new, newcomer's party? There is a newcomer's party. I said, I don't know. She said, nobody invited you? I said, no. She called somebody, and she was really mad. She said, the, here is a newcomer family, and you didn't even invite them? So she said, you are coming. I said, I can't. She said, go home. I make some tiny little dish for your from your country and when you uh, from your country and when your husband come, get ready and go to the uh, uh, party. So I said I can't. I have two younger children. She said, No, 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 no. I said I don't know anybody who who is going to be babysit my children. Said, I am going to come and do it. <laughs> don't worry. You get ready. So I called my husband and told. He said. I don't like that. I don't like any unknown uh, woman looking after me. I don't see any uh, look after me. I said, I think she, I can trust her. Uh, and another thing she, she told me that, uh, Johan, my door is always, 24 hours is open. So I don't cl close the door. And any time you, are, you want to come, come, it is your home. And also very poorly furnished, old, old things. So I thought America means wealthy country, rich country, big, big house, so everything is golden and all that. But why, why her house is so poorly? She couldn't understand. I said, she's not pure, poor. She cannot then have, uh, live uh, uh, in this uh, house, her own house. So that was, I was thinking a little bit different. She's different. And then when I told Father Father, but I, I changed myself and cooked something and get ready. And here she comes, just at 6 o'clock. She came with a big box of book and, 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 and toys. Sit down on the floor, and two, two daughters, they were all around her, and she was reading books to them. And Father came. Father oh. came, I'm not going anywhere. And then finally she saw, she said, wow. She said, she really came. So we went, <laughs> enjoyed it, and since then she is my mentor, mm. she is my mother, she is my teacher, she is my friend. She, she taught me to be American, mm. to be mm. American. She taught me my, my uh, how to how to drive. She took took me how to eat. She taught me good food. Where is the good food? Where is the good bread? Mm. And she became Perfect. my um, political advisor. She made me member of the domestic, she just find out, find out that I was politi political, uh, progressive politician. My husband was in jail for eight years. So, you know, uh, we are for, 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 she said, so she took me the, the Democratic Women's Party, made me a member, and, and then she took everywhere to, to, uh, to um, raise fund. Van Hollen, she introduced me in, in a lunch for Van Hollen, and, and I first, first day I gave only $25, and th after that I gave $500, sometimes $5,000. And she also took me to the, all these women's uh, rally. You know, the, the one rally she took me, I will never forget. That was 100,000 100, 100, 100, women, all in white dress. And I also, she t took me. And from it, it was so, I was always some in rally in Bangladesh, but not so huge. From Lincoln Memorial to the Capitol Hill, it's all women and, and children and some of the men also. And I felt like I'm so strong. I'm part of this group. So I'm not tiny Nurjahan in a little sari or from Bangladesh. I am somebody. I am a woman and I, I am. I can do anything. If I join them, I can do anything. And I taught my children, my two daughters, mm. that this is it. it and Rose was my, uh, in the last, uh, uh, you know, she lived 100, all, uh, th uh, one month before 100. And she was so strong, she lived alone. And now my children tell me, you are just like, a, and I meant like a Rose. <laughs> Because I, she, is, she controlled everybody. She called me in front of me. Or something was, it was a newspaper. And she said, Henry, Henry Kissinger? And she was talking like that. Henry, do you have you seen that was in the Washington Post? I said, my God. 
is calling Henry. <laughs> so she was that strong and that, uh, and whatever she told me, whatever is wrong, you have to protest no John. <laughs> Anything you see wrong, said, get down and do it. So I learned everything uh, to me. I'm so pr proud that I, I got to know, know her and my children also love, love her. They're, sometimes they <laughs> rebuke me that I'm like Rose, but I'm not. Oh, she, she's really great. a wonderful woman. So we've reached the end of our program, but we're going to have, I'll, probably you'll come up and the Politics and Prose folks will explain how the book signing will go. Um, if anyone's interested in my book, I'll be at the back. I can sign, and I have a couple of events in November. But at this point, we want to give a very big round of applause to Auntie for this wonderful accomplishment. And then I'll turn it back over to Alyssa. Well, uh, thank you all so much for joining us today and for such a wonderful conversation. Let's give everyone another round of applause. <laughs>